As a young adult sitting in a physiological psychology class, I reflected upon definitions the professor scrawled on the board, schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. I raised my hand and asked, what do you get when you cross one of those with one of those? The professor looked befuddled. I asked because that's my mother. I pointed to the word schizophrenia. And that my father, I pointed to the words bipolar disorder. I noted the professor's eyebrows raise and sh as she began to comprehend, or perhaps it was fear I saw. A few of my classmates turned to look at me. Oh my, the instructor gasped as she erased those terms. <laughs> but I remained lost in haunting memory. My mother was an only child like me. An Elizabeth Taylor look-alike, she was petite, five foot two, with high cheekbones, perfectly arched brows, and a flawless complexion. Despite her natural gifts, she applied makeup pancake batter thick and cemented her eventual towering beehive hairdo in place before she ever ventured out of the house. She had a taste for fashion and a passion for Bloomingdale's. Her favorite haunt, where she bought her clothes even when we were on food stamps. It was her remarkable loveliness that first caught the eye of my father, a brilliant and talented commercial artist who was born on Christmas Day. People claimed he looked like Richard Chamberlain. My parents made a handsome couple, and I understood they were very much in love once, but I didn't get to witness much of that. Soon after becoming parents, their relationship became stormy and ridden with insurmountable challenges, a cross between Wuthering Heights and Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, ironically, two of their favorite movies. I'm told my mother was born a blue-eyed blonde, but I only knew her to have hazel eyes and jet black hair. The story is that the pigmentation of her hair ch and eyes changed over one feverish weekend when she endured a wicked collection of childhood illnesses, including measles and strep. Family members speculated that this might have predisposed her to the mental illness that lurked behind her picture-perfect exter exterior. She had a complete nervous breakdown at 26 shortly after I was born. That's when she discovered all the tape recorders hidden in the walls and began suspecting complex conspiracies plotted against her. The diagnosis, paranoid schizophrenia. So my father and maternal grandmother ended up sharing the parenting responsibilities for me while my mother was institutionalized at the Creedmoor State Mental Hospital in New York where she received electroshock therapy 21 times. She refused to engage in any type of talk therapy, so she was prescribed multiple psychotropic medications, including Thorazine, and sent home. The day she returned, I watched my parents hugging and sobbing in the hallway. At only three years old, I could feel an intense electric connection between them, and I squeezed between their knees to be a part of it. By the time I was five, hope for my mother's full recovery waned, and my father's bipolar symptoms began to manifest. In one manic episode, he came to believe he was Jesus because they shared a birthday. And then he sank into a deep depression when he wasn't crucified before he turned 33. Unable to cope and unhappy with the lithium his doctor prescribed, he chose to self-medicate, initially with ale and eventually with Gordon's gin. Then he signed up from, for some college writing classes to give voice to his pain. My mother was frequently the subject of those short stories, something that infuriated her. When he began submitting for publication, the possibility of exposure exacerbated her paranoia 
and the rejection letters, every one of which he kept, plunged him deeper into depression. His therapist encouraged him to leave, and after several false starts, he managed to desert us when I was seven. He abandoned his job, absconded with the family savings, and spent some time in Venezuela, either grieving or celebrating, I'm not quite sure. My mother and I were left without money or medical benefits. Fortunately, we lived in my grandparents' house, and they didn't evict us when my mother failed to pay the rent. <laughs> but I was then a child being raised by an angry, mentally ill woman who lacked medical insurance to cover her prescriptions and who often took liberties with the quantity of medication she took or skipped. After school each day, I would dive under my bed to cuddle with the dust bunnies, eyes closed tight, arms over ears, sobbing and chanting, please stop, like a mantra. My mother's tirade involved circling my bed, ranting about my father, detailing her inventory of hostilities. I lacked the vocabulary to fully understand, but I got the gist. She also suffered from insomnia and spent the wee hours of the night chugging coffee and chain smoking. I would shudder in my bed listening to the slow, repetitive clink clink of her spoon in the coffee cup. Sometimes she would wake me during the night when she turned on the lights in my room and paced around my bed carrying on a one-sided conversation. My father was often the subject of those wild midnight ramblings. I'd keep my eyes closed and try hard not to shiver so she'd think I was asleep. Sometimes she'd turn the temperature of my electric blanket up so high that I'd wake up sweltering. In the morning as I ate breakfast, I would stare in awe at the extensive numerical calculations and complex ink doodles on the yellow legal pad she kept next to her overflowing ashtray on the kitchen table. Midday naps made up for her late night activities, and she would demand I rest with her. Our attached bedrooms allowed her to be aware of my every move. I would lay there frozen and wide-eyed for an hour or more while she snored. When I began to suffer from night terrors, she insisted it was because I read too many creature feature and monster magazines, so she threw them out. Oddly, the night terrors didn't cease. One night, when I was about 15 and studying for an economics test in our living room, my mother marched in, stopped abruptly, and faced me. When I looked up, I could see that her eyes were black, the pupils fully dilated. Never a good sign. So I braced and calculated my escape route. When the accusations and swinging began, I grabbed my mimeograph notes and took cover in the bathroom, hooking the little latch on the rickety door. I jumped into the cold, claw-footed bathtub and surveyed the red velvet wallpaper that surrounded me. I leaned back and stared at the red enamel ceiling while my mother spewed obscenities and pounded the door. Open the door! Open it now, you goddamn little bitch! I turned my gaze to the trembling hook that was bouncing in its little silver ring and wondered if it would hold up or if she might shake it loose. A few times she tugged so hard that I could see a sliver of separation between the door and the jam. I held my notes in my left hand. The nails of my right were dug into my palms so hard they left behind deep red crescents. I spent that night in the tub and snuck out in the morning when she finally went to bed. I failed the economics test that day. When I was 16, my clashes with my mother were erupting more violently. I had to escape. The only option I could come up with was to join some local teens on an abandoned property. But when I shared my plan with my father, he suggested an alternative, move in with him. I was surprised and hopeful, despite the fact that he lived in a rundown Manhattan hotel. 
My mother was furious, but I moved into his dingy, cockroach-infested 11th floor room despite her objections. It was as tiny as a dorm room, with one large, low window directly across from the door. We opened my rollaway cot in the space between the foot of his bed and a small dresser. I was grateful to be there, away from my mother's insanity, and as long as my father got home before 11 at night, he would seem sober as he nursed a couple of nightcaps before going to sleep. But if he stayed out longer, I was afraid. There was nowhere to hide. One night, my father and I were talking, me sitting cross-legged on my cot, he on the edge of his bed. I could tell he was manic and intoxicated. He turned his attention to my college plans. What exactly do you think you're going to do with a degree in anthropology, Karen? I mean, how will you make money? I'm going to be an archaeologist, I asserted. You're stuck in the past, my father slurred with disgust, taking another swig of his gin and tonic and looking sideways at me. You can't hack the present, babe, so you're just going to hide in the past, digging up other people's bones. He proceeded to condemn my aspirations, painting a bleak picture of my future. Hearing my dreams eviscerated brought me to tears, and he laughed at me. Then he placed his hand on my head. I am the Christ, and I will heal you. Father in heaven, heal Karen through my hands. Help her let go of the past and embrace the future. She is just a little girl, a very angry and frightened one. Help her see that she doesn't have to hide. Heal her. I pulled away while he was basking in that moment of grace, but before I knew what was happening, I felt his hands around my neck. I'm going to put you out of your misery, he growled. Somehow I got to my feet and we struggled. Then I found myself hanging out of the 11 story window, the small of my back on the low windowsill, his hands still around my throat. Still in shock, I gasped for air while looking up at the New York City sky, light swirling above me as I flailed and punched, trying not to fall. With a surge of adrenaline, I was finally able to push him off and backwards onto his bed, only because he was sufficiently inebriated, and I darted out into the hallway, shoeless, wandering the stairwell for hours in my rainbow toe socks. Later, after he finally passed out, I went back in, curled up on my cot for a restless sleep, no idea of where else I might go. My father vanished without warning for a few months right after I graduated high school. Working for minimum wage at a restaurant, I panicked every time the manager inquired about the rent. Fortunately, I had one free meal a day at work. The day I left for college, my boyfriend came to pick me up. We were almost finished packing his car with my things when my father appeared walking down the street toward us, a scowl on his face. He wanted to talk, but I was agitated and anxious to flee. He hurled a barrage of curses at me and I jumped into the passenger seat. Go, I yelped, and we sped away. I leaned back and closed my eyes, hands clenched in nails, digging into my palms. I took a long, deep breath as my father's voice grew more and more distant, eventually drowned out by the sounds of traffic. 